Cluster B personality disorders are characterized by dramatic, overly emotional, and unpredictable thoughts and behavior. From Ars Longa Media, this is Cluster B, scientifically informed, expert insights into the four Cluster B personality types, antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorder. Here's today's host, Dr. Todd Grande. This is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I provide an update on the Johnny Depp Amber Heard lawsuit? Today I'll be looking at day eight of the trial, which is day four of Johnny Depp's testimony, and included the testimony of personal assistant Ben King. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. First, I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll move to my analysis. In December of 2018, an op-ed written by the actress Amber Heard was published in the Washington Post. Without naming her ex-husband Johnny Depp specifically, she implied that he mistreated her during their romantic relationship. Johnny Depp sued her for defamation, and Amber Heard countersued him. In April of 2022, the trial began in the Fairfax County Courthouse in Virginia. Here is the summary of the testimony. I have rearranged the order of some of the items and I have paraphrased. Amber Heard's defense attorney continued presenting various items designed to attack Johnny Depp's character and credibility. Here we see he brought up a number of audio recordings and text messages. A few examples of statements made in the audio recordings. Amber Heard said to Johnny Depp, go put your blank cigarettes out on someone else. You blank have consequences for your actions. Johnny Depp responds, shut up fat blank. In other recordings, he referred to an argument as a bloodbath, he was clearly yelling, and he suggested he was never getting clean and sober. A few examples of text messages referencing Amber Heard, Johnny Depp wrote, she will hit the wall hard. He texted, I will never mention this blank's name again. He texted a physician and said, I cut the top of my middle finger off. This is important because Johnny is accusing Amber of cutting his finger off by throwing a large bottle of vodka at him when they were in Australia. We also see another text message where Johnny suggested that Amber was supportive. Amber's attorney confronted Johnny with a number of articles published in the media that were quite negative. Most of them referenced Johnny's substance use issues. Essentially, the cross-examination was just a continuation from day three of Johnny Depp's testimony there was nothing really groundbreaking. It was designed to embarrass Johnny and make him out to be violent, coarse, and unrefined. At this point, we move to redirect. So now Johnny Depp's attorney is asking him questions. Johnny's demeanor changed. He went back to appearing relaxed. He talked about how he was shocked and hurt after seeing the op-ed. He had lost his ability to speak out on his own behalf and realized something had to be done. So he's explaining why he filed the lawsuit. He was very disappointed about being dropped from the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. He said he built the Jack Sparrow character. This is something he talked about under direct examination as well. He said it was his intention to give the characters a proper ending, suggesting that he would have continued to play the character if Disney had permitted him to do so. His attorney asked him about a statement he made at a press conference indicating he would not play Jack Sparrow again even if he was offered $300 million. Johnny made it clear that the statement was made long after this mess started. I'm curious as to whether or not Johnny's policy applies to related products. For example, I wonder if this means we shouldn't expect Johnny Depp to star in the exercise spin-off video, Pilates of the Mediterranean, featuring Major Mac Arrow. Just as a point of reference, Pirates of the Caribbean 4 was the most expensive movie ever made at $379 million. I have a feeling Johnny would scuttle his animosity for $300 million. He could exchange that for a lot of pieces of eight. Continuing with the summary, Johnny's attorney asked questions about the mean text messages. Johnny essentially explained the unkind messages by characterizing them as humorous, irreverent, and abstract exaggerations. They were not intended to be real. Johnny explained the bloodbath reference by saying it was a book he mentioned during a lighthearted exchange. Johnny's attorney directed him to explain other potentially damaging items. Johnny explained his use of the term monster. It had two meanings, drug use and his willingness to participate in arguments. 
He only used the word because he heard it frequently from Amber. He explained the writing he did in blood and paint on the walls of the house in Australia, saying it was a reference to Amber's lies. He explained the reference to cutting his finger off by implying it was a figure of speech and noted he had no motive to cut the tip of his finger off. I imagine that many people also lack that motive. Johnny defended himself against the cabinet attack video, which featured him banging cabinets and pouring himself a large serving of wine. He suggested that it was not the result of any type of argument between him and Amber. Johnny denied ever putting a cigarette out on Amber, calling the claim ludicrous. At this point, we hear a series of audio recordings. In these recordings, we hear Amber pressuring Johnny to stay in fights. She didn't like it when he would retreat from arguments. Johnny thought it was a good idea to cool down, to spend a few hours apart after an argument. Amber is averse to Johnny threatening to leave her. She talked over Johnny and repeated the same phrases over and over in an irritating and overbearing way. Johnny specifically mentioned borderline personality disorder in one recording. In reference to Johnny's tendency to create space during an argument, Amber said, you are making it worse for me. At another point, she said things like, please stop, I will die, and you are killing me. There was a sound of desperation in her voice. This did not appear to be in response to any threatened physical violence. She was saying this because he was threatening to leave her. Johnny attempted to explain an audio recording from July of 2016. This had been brought up during cross-examination to demonstrate that Johnny was doing something dangerous with a knife. He clarified that he was not threatening to harm himself. He took the knife out of his pocket and said, Here, cut me, take my blood. He was trying to express to Amber how he had nothing left to give her. She had destroyed him. The last recording that was discussed may have been the most important for Johnny's case. It was also between him and Amber. Johnny indicated to Amber that they could write a letter together to address the damage to the reputations which was occurring in the media. Amber complained that the last time they argued, she thought as though she would lose her life. Johnny responded by saying, Amber, I lost a blank finger man, come on. He continued by saying, I had a blank can of mineral spirits thrown at my nose. Amber's response was chilling. She said, you can say it was a fair fight. Then, in what has to be one of the most damaging statements that has come to light so far, Amber said, tell the world, Johnny, tell them, Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man. I'm a victim, too, of domestic violence. Johnny responded, yes, I am. Before the proceedings concluded on April 25, a personal assistant named Ben King testified, his testimony went on for quite some time. I will try to compress it as much as I can while still retaining the key points. Ben King is a personal assistant who looked after Johnny and Amber in London and during the notorious finger-cutting incident in Australia in 2015. During his time with them in London, he remembered an incident where Amber shouted, there were loud footsteps, and more shouting. He also remembered an incident where Amber yelled at Johnny saying, why did you take your hand away from me? Johnny left the room which of course is consistent with Johnny's assertion that he often retreated. During his time with the couple in Australia, Ben witnessed several arguments during which Johnny would leave the room. Ben said that Amber drank one or two bottles of wine a day. He then moved to the specific date of the finger-cutting incident, March 8, 2015. He was called to the house even though it was a Sunday. He saw Amber. She was hysterically sobbing. The house had sustained $50,000 in damage. There was blood in many areas, broken glasses, items were strewn about. Ben was asked to help find Johnny Depp's fingertip, which he did. It was near the bar. He flew back to Los Angeles with Amber. During that flight, Ben asked her what happened. Amber responded by asking him a question. Have you ever been so angry you just lost it? She was surprised when Ben King said that he had not. Not long after that flight landed, Ben noticed long, uniform marks on Amber's arm. Johnny had also left Australia for a short time. The couple returned in April. They were initially pleasant. Ben said it was like a honeymoon. Before too long, they were arguing again. He saw Johnny leave into another room. Nothing meaningful happened during the cross-examination and redirect of Ben King. Ben appeared to be a highly credible witness. 
Now moving to my analysis. As I mentioned in another video, I think the point of this trial from Johnny Depp's perspective is to win over the public. He wants to convince people that he was the victim in the situation. He's not perfect. For example, he had some difficulties with substance use, but he is not violent. He did not deserve to be thrown out of the movie business. I thought that Johnny Depp gained some ground under direct examination, lost some ground during cross-examination, and gained most of what he lost back under redirect. On April 25 specifically, Johnny made a lot of progress. For example, he was able to attribute his unkind language to expressiveness, establish that he was the one to retreat during arguments, showcase Amber's irritating and persistent style of arguing, offer a convincing argument that Amber may have been responsible for him losing his fingertip, and demonstrate how Amber appeared to be aware that a male victim of domestic violence is considered less believable by the public. She pointed that out to Johnny Depp, which suggests she is capable of manipulation and deception. From Johnny Depp's testimony, it seems clear the relationship he had with Amber was toxic. By definition, this is going to make both parties look like they have poor judgment. People wonder why Johnny did not leave. Why did he let himself suffer to such an extent? Clearly, he had the financial resources and the support necessary to escape. This is a key issue that needs to be addressed for Johnny to win the hearts and minds of the public. Given the testimony up to this point in the trial, I think there is a path emerging whereby Johnny can address this issue. There is an image forming that may show the destructive dynamic of the relationship. I will offer a potential conceptualization of this case that I believe may be coming into focus. I don't know for certain that it is. This is really just a theory based on the limited information available right now. It's something that may be happening based on the evidence. Before I explain this theory, I need to review the concept of borderline personality. As I mentioned, Johnny Depp specifically referred to borderline personality disorder in one of the recordings. There is no way to know if anyone in this case has been diagnosed with a disorder, but the diagnosis itself is not what's important here. The diagnostic classification is just a category that's used for treatment. It doesn't really have any other purpose. It's not that useful for conceptualizing personality. Borderline personality existed long before the disorder. Many people have borderline personality traits without having any mental disorder. Some of the traits include being vindictive, being insecure. They're part of vulnerable narcissism. A fear of being alone, the tendency to intensely love and hate a romantic partner, impulsivity, and emotional instability. With that in mind, I will move to the conceptualization. Again, this is just a theory. I believe this is the theory that Johnny Depp is trying to prove. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard were strongly attracted to one another, so much so that they kissed each other when they were both with other people. The passion was strong. It felt right and perfect. Johnny Depp had experienced a lot of pain in his life. He was averse to conflict. Unfortunately, he was not averse to using substances. They helped him to stay out of pain. Amber was much more demanding and controlling than Johnny expected. When he would not give in to her attempts to control him, her insecurity would be activated and she would become aggressive. Johnny could not stand the conflict, therefore he would retreat. It was not a sign of weakness, he was simply trying to avoid pain. Johnny's own insecurities were activated by Amber's constant criticism. In a sense, he started believing some of her unkind remarks. If she was right, then he was a bad person and lucky to have her. That's what he could be thinking. More importantly, if she was right, it justified him staying in the relationship. It made sense of all her aggression and hostility. He would not blame her and want to leave. Rather, he would blame himself. In a sense, he was deceiving himself. A similar dynamic could have been happening to Amber Heard. She had a fear of abandonment, which compelled her to attack. She didn't have the emotional depth to negotiate a romantic relationship, so she tried to keep it by brute force. She didn't feel like a good person when she attacked Johnny, therefore she needed to believe that his drug dependency made him a bad person. In addition, she needed to believe that he was attacking her when he was only defending himself. Somehow, he was now the aggressor. This made her behavior acceptable in her mind. This balanced the scale. One could argue that both of them needed to believe that Johnny was deeply flawed. 
That is a key component of any relationship that involves borderline personality traits or vulnerable narcissism. The victim is going to dislike themselves and the perpetrator is going to agree with the victim's assessment. Ultimately, Johnny stands up to Amber. He has had enough. He realizes it's not working no matter how attractive he finds her. By asking for a divorce, Johnny inflicts tremendous damage. This rejection was intolerable to Amber. Now, instead of Amber feeling balanced, like she was aggressive, but it was okay because Johnny was flawed, Amber feels slighted. She believes herself to be the victim and goes on a crusade to convince the public that she was. From Johnny's perspective, this is a bridge too far. He was willing to conclude the relationship on peaceful terms, but Amber violated the arrangement by claiming to be a victim. Johnny found his voice and sought justice. I think that on day eight of the trial, the data in this case appear to fit this theory better than they have at any other point in the trial. This is a nuanced and complex theory based on how narcissistic relational partners can cause damage. It's not common knowledge, therefore it's not clear how well this dynamic will resonate with the public. If nothing else, I hope this trial brings awareness to the intense toxicity of vulnerable narcissism and how frequently romantic partners deceive and manipulate in the context of romantic relationships. For more content like this, check out Healthy Toxic, another podcast from Ars Longa Media, all about what makes or breaks relationships, including issues related to narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and how personality disorders affect relationships. Ars Longa, Vita Brevitz. Learn more at ArsLonga.media.